Hi everyone, I'm Mark, and today we're going to be looking at the most important details that you should know about flight sim charts, from airport diagrams to departure, arrival, and approach procedures. We're going to be doing a flight from Boston up to Montreal, and each step along the way we're going to focus on the charts, what they're telling us, what constraints we need to be aware of, and how we're going to use them to get from A to B. We're going to be looking at the Jeppesen charts format today, since that's the most popular format with flight simmers, because that's what's included in Navigraph. And we're going to start from the beginning with the airport diagram. Depending on the size of the airport you're using as your departure point, you'll likely have a bunch of buildings on the periphery of the airport, which are represented in black. And for an international airport like Boston, there's going to be multiple terminal buildings from where you can start an airliner flight. One piece of information that you won't see on these charts is which terminal is used by which airline. And unfortunately, there are no other charts that you can reference to find that information either. So your best bet for that is actually going to be to use something like Flight Radar 24 to see which gate is being used with the airline that you're flying. The larger gray areas represent the ramps around the airport, and generally the cargo ramps are going to be clearly identified so that you can start your freight dog flight in the right spot. And the general aviation area should also be easily identifiable if you're starting from a larger field as well. Each taxiway on the chart is identified by one or two characters, so when you're ready to get moving, you'll typically get an instruction to follow a series of taxiways. And for today, we're going to be going to runway 22 right via Alpha and November, so it's a fairly simple taxi instruction to follow. As we're following our taxi route and we turn on to November, you're going to notice there's some red circles marked with the letters HS next to them, and there's a few of these around the airport as well. They're there to identify areas that are more at risk for incidents with other planes, but for the most part, unless you're flying in a big online event, it's not something that you'll really need to worry about in flight sim. Each runway has an identifier associated to it, and one common mistake is to assume that the runway identifier is the actual magnetic heading of the runway, but that's often not going to be the case. Right below the runway identifier is where we can see the magnetic heading of the runway. So if you were coming in to land on an ILS or even a visual approach, you'd want to fly the 215 course to stay lined up with the runway center line. Another thing to double check when you're coming in to land is the runway elevation, which is always right near the threshold, so it's super easy to spot. And this can be different from the airport elevation, as well as different from one runway to the next. And even a given runway can have a different elevation on one end from the other, so it's really important to double check it. The runways themselves are shown in black, and a white rectangle that goes across it, like we see here on 22 right, represents a displaced threshold which you can line yourself up on for takeoff, but for landing, you're going to want to make sure to land beyond the displaced threshold where the runway actually starts. The runway lengths are marked in feet with meters just next to it if you prefer that. And the other thing that you might notice about them at airports with intersecting runways are lines that are marked with the letters LASSO. And no, this is not a Ted LASSO reference. This is actually something called a land and hole short line. Like the name says, say if we were landing on four left and we were asked to land and hold short, we have to come to a complete stop before we reach that line to avoid any traffic that might be departing the perpendicular runway. But this can be a lot trickier than it sounds, especially if you're landing a bigger jet and you end up floating a little bit down the runway and it doesn't leave much room for error. One last thing of note, if you're flying into a smaller field, you can also spot the windsock locations on the chart, which can make it a lot easier to figure out the wind if you're flying into a field that doesn't have a METAR. So you can just fly right over the field and you'll know exactly where to look for it. There are, of course, a bunch of other little details here and there on the airport diagram, but we've covered the most useful ones to know about, so we can look at our departure procedure next. From takeoff, our route for today has us flying the Highland 7 departure out to the north, which is what's known as an RNAV departure. But there is another type of departure procedure as well that doesn't require a GPS to fly it, called a conventional departure procedure. RNAV departures are much more common these days, since modern planes are all RNAV capable. However, if you're flying an older plane that can't do RNAVs, say like the BAE-146, the 727, or even an analog plane like the C310R or the King Air, then you'll need to use the conventional SID instead, which you'll be able to fly with only the radio navigation instruments that you have on board. 
with all of the information that there is on a departure chart, it can be a little bit confusing when you first look at it because there's just information all over the place. But the way I approach it is to just focus in on the airport and the runway that I'm using and then just make my way around the chart looking for everything relevant to that. Starting from the top, we've got the name of the procedure as well as which runways it applies to. So the first thing that I do is make sure that I'm looking at the right chart that includes our departure runway, which for today is going to be 22 right, so we're all good. There's also a speed restriction in red right below that, but it's for runway 15, so it doesn't apply to us, but it's saying that departures on that runway shouldn't exceed 210 knots until they reach 520 feet. To the left of that, we've got a few restrictions that apply to the entire procedure. The radar required one here is something that you'll see on a lot of charts and in flight sim, so long as you have a GPS of some kind on board, you'll be all set. The second restriction tells us that this procedure is only applicable to jet aircraft. So if we were flying anything with a propeller, we'd have to find a different procedure that doesn't say that, which will often end up being the conventional SID that we were talking about earlier. Right below that, we have a text description of how to fly the departure. And although it matches exactly what you'll see in the plan view below, sometimes there can be a little bit more detail in the text description. So it's always a good idea to review it to make sure you didn't miss anything. Taking off from runway 22 right, we've got to fly our runway heading of 215, which we saw earlier, until we can go direct to TJ on a course of 142. And we can't exceed 210 knots on this leg either. The other thing we have to do is cross TJ at or above 1200 feet. That's what that line under the 1200 is for. But that really shouldn't be a big problem considering the climb performance of our plane today. There's no at or below restrictions on this chart though. However, sometimes there can be some additional routing information that applies to all runways, which is why it's important to look at everything on the chart. And for today here, there are some climb instructions that you'd want to be aware of if you're flying with some type of ATC, be it either AI or VATSIM. Each of the waypoints of the departure procedure should match what you've loaded into the plane, but you can always also refer back to the chart as well to see the heading between each of the waypoints as well as the distance in nautical miles between each of them. That pretty much covers it for our departure procedure details. And although we have no en route waypoints today because it's a pretty short flight, if we did, what we could do is switch into either the high altitude or the low altitude IFR chart, depending on how high we were going, with the high altitude airways chart used for everything above 18,000 feet. Our route for today is pretty direct, but depending on where we were going, the route can overlap with all the different airways that are going in all different directions, with the blue ones being RNAV only routes and the black ones being more conventional routes that any airplane can fly. If your route coincides with an airway, you would typically have the first waypoint where you're joining the airway on your flight plan, as well as the last one where you're going to be leaving it. And in some cases, like on 737, you can even enter the airway into the route page as you're plugging it all in. On top of the airways and waypoints that are scattered everywhere, the low and high altitude IFR charts also show you the locations of VORs along with their frequency that you need to tune to pick them up on your radios. And you'll need that information if you're going to be doing an analog flight with no GPS to navigate across long distances. Our star or arrival chart for this flight is also an RNAV procedure. And although there are still some non RNAV stars at most big airports, it really feels like everything is going RNAV these days. So it's getting harder and harder to fly old school routes and flight sim. I use the same process to figure out what I need to know for the star directly, just like for the departure. What I do is I start by looking at what runway I'm landing on, and then I find all of the relevant information for that on the chart. We're landing on 24 right today and just looking at the restrictions along the route to get there, there are a few altitudes that we need to be at or below like the 9,000 feet at Dunup, 4,000 at Sildo or even above 3,000 but below 4,000 at Kurdu. Another thing we haven't seen yet are hold points, which are places along the route of the arrival where you could be asked to hold for a given amount of time in a loop, with the direction of the hole being indicated by the direction of the arrows on the chart. There can also be some restrictions for the hold as well, like this one at LTAT. The fastest we can go is 210 knots as we're flying it, and normally ATC would also assign you an altitude at which you would do the hold.
if there's any mountains or elevation in the area, you'll also see that on the chart and it can be very important if you're flying into a mountainous area. And we have a little bit here, but nothing major. And some peaks are going to be shown plainly as their altitude in feet and others are going to be represented in thousands and hundreds of feet instead. The last and probably most important chart that you're going to need to understand fairly well is the approach. And there are a bunch of different possibilities here from an ILS, the localizer, RNAV, VORs, and even NDB approaches can be available depending on the airport that you're landing at. The number one factor I use to pick which approach I'm going to fly is the weather. If there's low visibility, then I'm going to pick the approach that gives me the lowest minimum descent altitude, which will usually be an ILS approach if there's one available. Most of the time, though, when the weather isn't a factor, I'll actually pick the approach that looks like the most fun or interesting to fly, just to spice things up a little bit. And that often ends up being an RNAV approach, although the ones here into Montreal are about as tame as you can get. Instead of making our way top down, what we'll actually do is brief this chart like I do normally when I'm doing a flight. And I usually start by looking at the plan view because it has almost all of the information I need to quickly get up to speed on an approach. The first thing I always look for are the frequency and the inbound course of the approach. Here we can see the ILS is on 101.9 on a course of 237. There's one particularity about this approach though. If you look closer at the runway, there's a localizer DME frequency listed there as well. And the reason that's actually there is if you look down at the minima section, there's actually two different ways to fly this approach. We can either do the full ILS with the localizer and the glide slope, or you can fly it with just the localizer and use your DME to figure out how low you can descend every step of the way with the profile view section. We're doing the ILS today though, so we'll use 306 feet as our minimums and that altitude is in MSL or mean sea level, with the number right next to it that's in parentheses being the altitude above ground level instead. And what you could actually do is use that number to have an idea if you're going to break out of the clouds on your approach, because cloud altitudes are also listed in AGL and META reports, so you can very quickly get an idea of how you're going to go on your approach. The other set of minimums that are just to the right are also for the ILS, but you would only use these if the approach lighting system was out, which is pretty unlikely to happen in flight sim, so we're not going to need it. Now the next thing which I often find myself fumbling and looking around for is the airport and the touchdown zone elevation or the runway elevation really, which is tucked away in the header section. So it's a really good one to make a mental note about where to find it. After that, the next thing that I check is the notes section to see if there's anything that I need to know about or familiarize myself with. Again, just to be sure that I don't miss anything important, like say for example, if the localizer is offset, that would probably be written here as well. If we go back to the plan view now, we'll review a few final details of the diagram. We can start off with the waypoint that's furthest out at Lona. You can see right above it, there's the letters IF, which identify it as the intermediate fix for the approach. There are normally three points along the approach that are marked as either the initial approach fix, the intermediate fix, and the final approach fix, which you can spot by looking down at the profile view, since it'll be identified by the Maltese cross. Each waypoint of the approach is also going to tell you how far out it is from the runway, which you can cross check on your DME, as well as any altitudes that you should cross the mat. So for example, here we want to cross Lona at 3000 feet. The final approach fix is also typically the altitude that you'll want to set in your autopilot as you're descending to intercept the glide slope. We can also see any peaks or buildings with enough elevation that we need to watch out for. And just past the end of the runway, we can also see the go around procedure outlined as well. But you can also see this a lot more clearly down in the profile view. So if we do end up having to go around, that's saying that we need to climb to 3000 feet on a heading of 237, at which point we can do a right turn and go direct to the Montreal VOR, at which point we'll have to do a hold until we're ready to shoot the approach again. The other bit of information can be very useful, especially when the glide slope is out or you're doing a localizer only approach, is the ground speed to feet per minute chart. That can give you a really accurate estimate of what your descent rate should be based on how fast you're flying the final approach. 
So in the A320 that we're flying today, we'd likely want to be somewhere around 700 feet per minute since we're flying our final approach at 130 knots. So we're somewhere between the 120 and the 140 numbers. There's a few last details to look at in the profile view, which has some of the same information as the plan view, but there's also a couple extra details as well. We can obviously see the same waypoints as the plan view, but we can more easily see the distance between each of them, as well as the bottom altitude for each segment. So for example, from Omeki to Volax, it's going to be 3.2 miles, and the lowest we can descend to is 1,500 feet. We already mentioned the Maltese cross at the final approach fix, and beyond that you can see the missed approach point depicted with the letter M. Right above the M, you can see it's telling us that once we've descended to our MDA and we hit 1.6 miles on DME, if we can't make out the runway yet, it's at that point that we're going to have to go around. Hope you learned something useful about reading charts in this video. If you did, please make sure to hit like and subscribe on your way out so you don't miss out on the next one.